We're um, at a location about 20 kilometers north of Merritt, British Columbia, along the Coquihalla Highway, which you can hear in the background, obviously. Uh, we're going to use this site to talk about the organic soil order, Canadian system soil classification. And a lot of ways it's appropriate to be here next to a highway because this site has been disrupted by highway construction, as have many other organic soils across the country and across the world. This site here will give us an opportunity to talk about the landscape in which these soils formed and what you can tell by looking at the soil profile. Most of the processes in the development of uh, mineral soils uh, it involve loss of material or weathering of material or whatever, of mineral, mineral constituents. The organic soil is quite unique in that the processes here quite often feature accumulation of materials. So I think that uh, it's time for us to hear from Kent here about how these materials accumulated in this landscape location. Yes, yeah, sir. These soils here, these accumulated deposits, develop in small lakes. So when the glaciers left this area, there was lakes scattered all over the landscape. They were freshwater lakes, and what happened is we'd have uh, algae vegetation growing on them, maybe some lily pads, other floating aquatic vegetation growing on the surface of the lake. And as that organic matter died, it sank to the bottom, and it slowly began to build up. At the same time, in the early stages of this lake development, we had uh, shelled organisms living in the water, and their shells can be seen in the lower reaches of this. And then over time, as the organic matter began to grow in from the sides of the lake, it slowly filled in the pond. And this organic matter then began to accumulate upwards towards the surface of the, of the pond until it eventually filled in, and the pond level would have been level with the the top of this organic deposit. Peat soils have been used by uh, a lot of people to gain a better understanding of natural history as well as human history. So there's a lot you can learn by looking at the, these uh, peat profiles. Uh, Kent, could you uh, talk a little bit about what we can see in this profile here? Well, Art, we'll start at the bottom of the profile because that's how it developed. At the bottom here, we have a, a lake bottom, which is probably quite a bit deeper than we're seeing here. And we had floating organic uh, vegetation on the surface of the lake, algae, uh, lily pads possibly. And as that organic matter died, the organic material settled to the bottom of the pond and it started to build up this layer in here. At the same time we had the floating aquatic vegetation, we also had uh, calcareous shell organisms living in the pond and they died and their shells settled to the bottom of the pond as well and intermixed with this organic layer here. Within the layer down below, at the bottom here, we have these shelled organisms and if I put some acid on this, you'll see that the shelled organisms fizz. The organic material does not. A paleontologist, a person who studies fossils, could examine these particular fossils and identify these organisms and maybe be able to date that way. Then what happened is there was a volcanic eruption at Crater Lake, Oregon about six to seven thousand years ago and there was this huge ash layer deposited over much of BC. And this is called the Mazama ash here and this is this bright white layer that we we're seeing and it's fairly common in, in BC uh, and even extends as far as Alberta. Uh, that ash settled on the surface of the lake and then sank to the bottom. As we come up a little bit we get this integrate with the the settling of organic matter again and the shells that we're seeing here. So we had this period of time when the water was open from here to here but at the same time organic vegetation is growing in from the side of the ponds and it just grows in and it dies and more organic matter grows on top of it. So it accumulates, grows inwards, and then starts to build up through the, through the profile. So from about here, we can see this nice organic matter that's developing and it comes up to about this stage here and all of a sudden we see this lighter colored layer and this is a volcanic ash layer. We don't know its date or when it was laid down. And as we move up through the profile, we have more peat deposition right up to here and there's a, another ash layer. Again, we don't know the, 
the dating of this one, and then the peat deposit continued to develop until the present day. We can look at this uh, soil profile and get some idea of the age of the deposit here, but how do we do that? There's a number of different ways we can date things, and with a peat soil we have organic material and woody material in the profile that can be carbon-14 dated. We found this stick in the profile below the Mazama ash layer. The Mazama ash layer has been dated to between six and 7,000 years old, so we know that this stick is older than that, so 7,000, maybe a little older. We know that this, this whole system began to develop about 10,000 years ago when glaciers left. So we know the date of a volcanic ash layer. We can also determine the date of this particular layer. We can determine the date of this particular volcanic ash layer as well. So knowing the dates of these three volcanic ash layers, you can figure out the rate of accumulation of the peat material through this particular profile. The other thing we can do is core samples and we can look at the pollen records in these uh, peat deposits and see what the vegetation was like around here, what was growing here, and the climatic conditions that existed when the glaciers first uh, left here. A few years back I was working on a, a project and we went down 10 meters and we hadn't hit the bottom of this organic deposit we were working on. So there's a lot of history in the pollen samples that you can find in these profiles. So by looking at pollen, we can date the plants, figure out what plants were uh, growing in the area, and even get a sense of what kind of climates were happening during that period of time. So as climate changes, pollen samples will change and you can actually get a good history of the climate conditions mm -hmm. over a period of time. One of the... Uh reasons that we have peat soils in the first place is because the biological activity in these soils, these materials, have been quite limited, allowing them to accumulate. However, the biological activity as expressed by decomposition is one of the bases for classifying these soils. So perhaps, Kent, you could illustrate that with this soil profile here. Yes, sir. We look at the soils, the organic soils, and we have three levels of decomposition that we can recognize. The first one, which is not really well expressed in here, is this what we would call fibric or, or fibric, where I can take pieces of material out of the profile, which I can identify the plant species. So this means that there's a lot of water in here, very low oxygen levels, and very slow decomposition. So fibric is the, the first um, degree of decomposition or lack of it. In most of this particular profile, we have moderately well decomposed material where we can still see the fibric nature, but we can't identify the plant species that this is coming from. So this is what we would call a mesic stage in decomposition. So it tells me that there are times there was oxygen able to get into this profile, so decomposition could proceed to some degree. So that's the, the mesic. This profile we classify as a mesosol based on this particular state of decomposition. The other state of decomposition is when you have lots of decomposition, there's lots of oxygen available, and the soil material decomposes down to this humus stage or humic uh, black material. And that's what's beginning to happen on this soil profile face is that once the road went in, the highway went in, this landscape was drained. So oxygen is now available to enter into this material and it's beginning to decompose. So this would be our OH horizon and there means there's lots of decomposition. This is the stuff that's really good for growing plants in because it's well decomposed. Peatlands and, and, and other wetlands too serve an important uh, ecological function and hydrologic function in uh, watersheds and they have importance to us and to natural ecosystems, whether they're developed or not. For example, when rainfall falls in a watershed, the wetlands like this would absorb the water and release it at a gradual rate, which uh, helps to prevent flooding and also to maintain stream flows later in the summer. They also serve as uh, a store for nutrients, releasing nutrients at a gradual rate. Obviously with management and with development these functions change and one of the main land conversions has been to clear these and, and develop them for agriculture. So Kent, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a, a summary of the effects of agricultural development on soils like we've been talking about here? 
In the interior here, uh, these deposits are used mostly for cattle grazing, so they're not really disturbed or manipulated in any uh, serious fashion, but they are grazed. The other uh, thing we have peat used for is for uh, horticulture purposes, for growing seedlings in nurseries, uh, either forestry nurseries or in uh, horticultural systems where the peat is actually mined and used to grow plants and, and seedlings in. The other disturbing thing that's happening in the world is that mankind likes to build houses and they will actually drain these environments, dig them out and actually refill them so they can build housing uh, complexes on them. And if these wetlands are in a natural wetland environment, as you've actually mentioned, they're developing in a, in a flood zone. And so these new subdivisions could actually wind up being flooded out just by the very nature of a building where water would normally want to go anyways. So Kent, you mentioned that in the interior here, ranchers graze these peatlands to some extent, but I understand they also use them for winter feed production. There have been research studies done and work done. What they do is they partially drain the wetlands and then they'll reseed them to other grass species. And then they crop these, these fields in the summertime to produce forage for overwintering their cattle. They're not grazed so much, but used to just produce more forage, especially further north where you don't have a lot of hayfield land available to you. In contrast to the use of organic wetland meadows by British Columbia's ranching industry, organic soils in the lower Fraser Valley and in other Canadian regions such as Ontario's Holland and Bradford marshes have been developed for intensively managed vegetable and fruit production. Agricultural practices include drainage, fertilization, liming and intensive tillage, all of which encourage organic matter decomposition and the subsidence of organic soils until they merge with underlying materials. In British Columbia's Cloverdale region, the underlying land surface prior to peat formation was an undulating floodplain with fine textured alluvium laid down in a marine environment. As the peat subsides, the marine clays are exposed and the soil's suitability for some crops, such as carrots, is diminished. In this field, you can observe the clays, that is the lighter colored materials, beginning to emerge from the darker colored peats that surround them. So the question must be asked, is agriculture sustainable on organic soils? Although the range of crops is slightly more narrow, the Cloverdale soils continue to be productive even after they subside. The management practices must adapt to the resultant soil, which will be much higher in mineral materials. In other cases, the underlying materials may be entirely unsuited to agriculture, boulders for example, and the loss of the peat signals the end of agriculture on the site. 